came with many crowns, a lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king throughout eternity. Crown him the Lord of lies, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways. From pole to pole that wars may cease, and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me, thy praise and glory shall Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder throughout the universe, power displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there pro 
proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Bless his name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, oh the precious name of Jesus, how which thrills us all the joy when his loving arms receive us. And his songs are tongues employ. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. At the name of Jesus bowing. Falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings and heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. I have a song that I want to sing before I preach. <clears throat> suffering and shame and thy love's that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for 
heart was on that old cross. Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean. cross I will ever be true it shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory falls trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. I want to read the first five verses of Galatians chapter 1. My plan is to spend some time in the book of Galatians. Galatians 1 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who praised him, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Galatians has often been called the, the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, uh, it is said to be Martin Luther's favorite book of the Bible and so has been identified as the foundation of the Protestant Reformation. We remember he was a very important person as it related to the Protestant Reformation and the breaking away from one organization and uh, the many things that happened there. Galatians deals with the most basic Christian doctrine, which is the means or the method of justification. Salvation comes by faith alone and not by obedience to a code of laws. The message of Galatians that salvation is based entirely on faith is vital for the Christian of every age. Galatians, we know, uh, was written to a specific 
group at a specific time, uh, somewhere around 49 or between 49 and 52. So it was written several thousand years ago. So it's important to keep that in the context of where it's at. The theme of Galatians is salvation by grace. Uh, one particular theologian states the one basic theme of Galatians is the gospel of justification by faith. Justification by faith. Galatians was written to combat one basic problem, and again, this was a problem that was happening 2,000 years ago, but we, I think we can learn very much from the book of Galatians in 2020. The problem was some Christians of Jewish background taught that Gentiles should adopt the Mosaic law and be circumcised and become a Jew in order to be saved. This, of course, struck at the heart of Paul's gospel of salvation by faith. The Judaizers then taught false doctrine and attacked Paul's authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so the letter to the Galatian Christians was a defense of Paul's personal place as an apostle and a proof of his, his doctrine. There is seven basic issues discussed in the six chapters of Galatians that are very important not only to the people at that time but to us today. And I'll just read the short list of those seven things. First one is the basis of man's acceptance with God. Number two, the supremacy and soul sufficiency of Christ. Three, the validity of Paul's gospel and apostleship. Four, the seat of authority in religion. Five, the relation of freedom to responsibility. Six, the unity of of the church, and seven, the universality of the Christian mission. The first ten verses in chapter one uh, introduce the letter and the problem that was going on at that particular time. Letters like this one written to the Galatians were written in the customary letter style that was common in Paul's day. There were three things were always included in the order of that uh, letters, customary letter style. The name of the writer, the person or group being written to, and some words of salutation, greeting, wishing the receiver or receivers well. The New Testament letters usually follow this style. One thing is for sure, this was a real letter, Galatians, written by a real apostle to real Christians with a very real problem at that time. There's four reals in that sentence, but it's worth reading again. A real letter written by a real apostle to real Christian people in a ver with a very real problem. Looking again at verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul is identifying himself by name as an apostle. The Greek word for apostle means one sent away. The word was used for a person sent as an officially commissioned representative of his sender. This has the idea of a mission and the office of an emissary. Paul, not only at the beginning, I believe, but always remained very conscious 
that he was sent representing someone other than himself. The apostolic office also signified the authority that originated with the sender. So Paul, I believe, uh, understood clearly his, his place and what he was appointed and what he was supposed to do. The second verse, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Paul linked some brethren with him in the sending of this letter. These brethren included whatever co-workers were with Paul at that time, men like Silas and Timothy, for example, as well as other fellow laborers. It was written to the churches at Galatia. The Greek word for church means called out ones, but that does not go far enough to help understand. One person suggested, so this particular statement was uh, injected in, as a help. Ancient Greek cities included a small number of privileged citizens who were called out of their homes and businesses from time to time to assemble and conduct the affairs of the city. This assembly was the word the early Christians took as the name of their church congregation. The word also includes the idea of a specially privileged and chosen group. As I was studying that about the word assembly, I was going to look up, but did not do. The word assembly, I was just thinking, I wonder if that is how the assembly of God, church, denomination, decided to come up with their name. That'd be interesting to, to look up, and I'm, I'm going to do that. <clears throat> the... The third standard part of that, that structure on the letter opening, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The third standard part of every letter opening in Paul's times was some word of greeting or well-wishing. Paul's desire was that the grace and peace of God, which are experienced through Christ, will be perfectly experienced by the Galatian Christians. The usual Greek greeting was a word of the same root of grace. The usual Jewish greeting was the Hebrew word for peace. The Christians put them together and the greeting served as a continual reminder that genuine grace and true peace are found only in God by Christ Jesus. Grace, as you know, is unmerited favor. We can't do anything to earn grace. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't earn grace. Grace is unmerited favor. And peace is an assured confident calmness of soul in respect to God. Peace is an assured, confident calmness of soul in respect to God. <clears throat> we as a nation, as a world, we need a real good dose of peace. Confident, assured calmness of soul in respect to God. Christians are the only ones who can experience in the truest sense the grace and peace of God. The question is, do we believe that today? Do we accept that Christians are the only ones who can experience in the truest sense the grace and peace of God. 
Verse 4 is, has three parts. Who gave himself for us, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, and that is the wording right out of the text, from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father. Notice the beginning of the verse says, who gave himself for us. They did not take his life. They thought they took his life, but he really gave his life. He could have not only called 10,000 angels, he could have called 10 million angels and stopped it. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. So it was God the Father's will that Christ Jesus go to the cross. And then verse 5 is a praise. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. But verse 4 and 5, uh, they contain two unique additions to Paul's customary opening. And the main reason is to affirm that forgiveness of sin is found only in the work of Jesus Christ. Not the law. Because we know in Scripture it says that Jesus came to fulfill the law. The false teachers at Galatia presented their case on two fronts. The first one was denying that the Apostle Paul was an apostle. And claiming that, the other point was, Justification requires not only faith, but also the obligations of law observance. Well, that went against everything that Paul stood for. So those were the two things that they were teaching falsely. Verse 4 itemizes three facts about the redemptive work of Christ. Jesus was sent to shed innocent blood, to redeem us, to buy us back. Those three facts about the redemptive work of Christ, he gave himself for our sin. This is the heart of the gospel and the foundation of, on which everything else is built. Next, tells us the purpose of Christ's redemptive work, the reason why he came, the reason why he was sent. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. The word translated deliver is a rare one in the New Testament, carries the idea of plucking out or snatching away. Rescue. This present world or age in the Greek is evil, and this is a this was a very unique sentence. This present world is evil because because it is the expression of him who is the evil one, the enemy of our souls. We know that the enemy, the evil one, does not like us. The evil one would love to destroy us all, according to the scripture. So the reason God the Father sent Jesus his son was to forgive us of our sins and to deliver us from this present evil world because it's expression of the one who is the evil one, the enemy of our souls. He and the age which he serves, or he and the age which serves his purposes would destroy us. Jesus gave himself to rescue 
us. The third thing indicated in verse 4 is that both of the previous facts were according to the will of God, our Father. It was the Father's will that Jesus come and make forgiveness possible and to go to the cross. More than one Greek word is translated will in the New Testament, and this one means desire. God wanted his son to give himself for our sins. It was God's desire for that to happen. God wanted him to rescue us from the age that imperils our souls. Three times in verses 1 through 4, God is identified as Father. Men would never have known God as a Father apart from the revelation of Him given by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> This sense of intimacy was one of the things the Jews found objectionable in Jesus' teaching. And again, this was written 2,000 years ago. They thought of him, God, as a stern lawgiver, but not as a loving father. <clears throat> verses 6 and 7 uh, have four, four serious things found in the false teaching. And that is what Paul wrote this for, to combat the false teaching and help folks get back on the straight and narrow. The first of these is being removed from him who called you. Read, read verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So he says that, that he was surprised that they had so quickly been sort of some teetering on the brink of going back and accepting and believing the falsehood. To accept the doctrine of justification of law and works was to be transplanted from the grace of God. The second involvement is the acceptance of a false gospel. Another gospel, which is not another, in Greek, the two, in Greek, the two another's are not the same. The first is a word which means another kind of. The second means another one of the same kind. The Judaizers' doctrine is a completely different sort of gospel, not a saving gospel. The third involvement is trouble. The Greek word translated refers to a commotion, a stir, an agitation, or a disturbing. Or a disturbing. There was serious commotion going on in Galatia at that time, and there is serious commotion going on in this country at this time. The fourth thing involved in the Judaistic false teaching was a willful perversion of the gospel. The false teachers were knowingly and deliberately turning the gospel into something else. Verses 8 and 9 are a sacred curse pronounced on any who would substitute anything for the pure gospel of justification through the finished work of Jesus Christ. The curse in 8 and 9 is so solemn it is stated twice. Paul included anyone potentially in the curse, himself, an angel, a man. Accursed is anathema. 
This word comes from the Old Testament idea of ban. It means that someone or something has been set aside for God's blessing or his judgment. Here the idea is that these false teachers have been a set aside for God's judgment. And this is the fate that they deserve. The word means anything placed up before God as an object in which he can display his wrath. You remember Joshua and Jericho? Jericho was set apart to the Lord as an object, and then Achan and his terrible sin. Paul, in this text, pronounced such anathema on the false teachers who were misleading the people. I read most of that, as you can see, because I thought it's, it's very, very important, and I wanted to be sure and go through that information as an introduction to the book of Galatians. Uh, one reason, and then two, there is very much parallel, pardon the English, between 2,000 years ago and today, uh, many of the issues, uh, I believe, happening and going on now. But the part, I guess, that really, uh, the most important part, I believe, and I wanted to stress quickly one more time, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God and the Father. Heard a song uh, either yesterday or last night. The name of the song was Does Anyone Here Need Jesus? I thought, I never have heard a song like that before. And they just kept repeating over and over again does anyone here need Jesus? And I thought, you know what? That is a very appropriate question to ask. Does anyone here need Jesus? If you do, you can come to this altar. If you do, you can either call me or text me or something, and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, if you already know Jesus and you feel that you need to spend some time talking to him, I invite you to do that. He came so that forgiveness would be made possible and to deliver us from this place to eternity with him. Eternity is a long, long time. It would be very, very sad to miss heaven, either by listening to a false teacher or list something false or what, whatever. I would not want to miss heaven because of anything down here. It, it's just not worth it. When you think of 70 or 80 or however many years we're here in comparison to eternity, let's stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time today. Lord Jesus, thank you that grace and peace can truly be found in you. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your life and shedding innocent blood so that we could know forgiveness of sin. Thank you, Father, 
that you cared and loved for us that much. Bless us as we go about the rest of this week. Help us to let our light shine for you. Thank you for helping us to be sensitive and aware whenever you impress on us or quicken us to see some of your handiwork. Lord Jesus, we're very much dependent on you. And we ask for the ones, all the different ones who are going through procedures and and surgeries and all kinds of stuff. We pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to each one. Bless us, Father, this day. We ask in your name and for your sake. Amen.